right. So welcome this morning to the session examining societal impacts of 2017 Atlantic hurricane season. Um, I'm Jenny Evans from Penn State and Leslie Wyborn is also here from ANU Australia. So let's get straight to the talk. So our first talk will be given by Alex Sherbinen um, on race income inequality. You can see the title. Thanks, Alex. Okay, well, thank you so much, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to Guido for being one of the co-organizers and encouraging a submission by CDAC, which is the NASA data center um, that we manage at season which is at columbia university also just briefly we'll mention pern which is one of the logos at the bottom it's a population environment research network it's free of charge it's a membership uh, org organization and uh, if you like the kinds of things that you see in this presentation you might want to join the member uh, join as a member of pern so briefly cdac is one of the nasa 12 distributed distributed active archive centers and uh, we basically serve as this gateway between the earth and social sciences. So that uh, may give you some context for the kinds of things I'm gonna present during this presentation. Um, and the kinds of data sets we produce include a lot of gridded population data sets. So our flagship data product is called the gridded population of the world, which now includes age and sex variables as well as just population counts by grid cell. So that's in that map at the top. Two other data products that I'll be using during this presentation include the U.S. Census Grids. Uh, so that's a gridded population data set that also includes population characteristics such as uh, African American in this case, in this map, and uh, so that's percent African American by grid cell, and uh, elderly and other characteristics, age and sex. Um, and then this is a gridded uh, new data set we actually just released yesterday. It's called, called the Global Man-Made Impervious Surface and Settlement Extents from Landsat. So this was produced by Eric Brown de Coulston at uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, we are now distributing that through CDAC. A number of other data sets in the list include infrastructure data, uh, climate-related data sets, including low elevation coastal zone data. Uh, by country, um, essentially representing the populations in the land areas in those low elevation coastal zones. Income and poverty and satellite derived environmental indicators uh, are examples of some of the types of data that we distribute. Plus we have a number of map clients. This is the basic map client on the left. We have a population estimation service that allows you to quickly get a population for a bounding box uh, or circle or any polygon you wish to describe. Uh, so that could be useful in flood zone mapping, for instance. And then uh, natural hazards mapper, which includes a number of natural hazards layers from NASA and uh, also allows you to do the same population estimates. And lastly, there's this uh, iPhone app or I I iOS app, which is called HasPop. So if you own an Apple device, you may want to download that because uh, you can do some of those same operations using this uh, iPhone uh, app. So the question of the presentation today is, is there a reason to suppose that disadvantaged groups are more likely to be exposed to hazards or disasters? And if you read the literature, generally what you'll hear is an unequivocal yes, uh, that the poor, the uh, racial minorities, and others who are sensitive to natural disasters are likely to be in areas or in harm's way disproportionately compared to the, the rest of the population. So a representative quote on the right is, research has demonstrated that vulnerable populations, in including disadvantaged populations of color, live in areas that may place them at higher risk of exposure to social and environmental hazards. And the question here, has the literature actually demonstrated this across the board? And of course, it's very hard to say across the board that anything is true. Uh, and I think what these studies tend to refer to are developing country studies, such as along the coast of Africa, where uh, flooding is very common. If you zoom in on uh, Lagos in Nigeria, which is the big circle on the coast, you see the high social vulnerability, very rapid population growth, and also potentially high exposure to flooding. And it's these kinds of contexts that typically the literature points to where people are living right on the coastal edge in 
uh, flood prone areas that are highly exposed. This is what I would call differential exposure. So we have two concepts. One is differential vulnerability. Not all population groups are e created equal. Some have higher education, higher income, maybe in racial or ethnic, uh, ethnic groups that are more favored, and some um, you know, are uh, less well off in those same characteristics. Uh, differential exposure is basically this concept that those groups are somehow differentially exposed to uh, the uh, stressors or hazards. So if you do a quick review of the literature, if you look at heat stress, what you find is generally the literature does confirm this differential exposure hypothesis. Basically, poor minority groups often live in more crowded neighborhoods uh, with less green space and therefore may be more affected by high temperatures. However, there are some examples where that's not so much the case. In terms of flood hazards, the evidence is more mixed for a number of reasons. For run, one reason, um, for one fact, the affluent, especially in developed countries, but also in developing countries, tend to live in or preferentially uh, live along the coast and in areas along riverbanks and things like that that may be more exposed to flooding. On the other hand, they may also, because of the collective action approach, which is you know, working together and binding together and having political influence, they may be able to uh, uh, sort of lobby politicians to get better coastal defenses. Um, on the other hand, poor populations may live in those kinds of areas, like in Lagos, that are more flooded uh, more frequently. So let's take a look. Um, here's New York City, and you can see the red and the purple areas are areas uh, where you have both high sensitivity and high heat stress, uh, according to one study that I was part of looking at both New York and Philadelphia. So this would be an example of differential exposure. Um, in Houston, Texas, relatively quick and dirty analysis that I did looked at income versus land surface temperatures, and if you take the greater Houston metropolitan area, you actually find that income tends to co-vary with um, uh, higher temperatures. So higher incomes uh, generally are areas with higher temperatures, especially in that downtown area. Um, the poverty of exposure bias was something that was put forward by uh, some World Bank researchers, and the idea is that the fraction, you look at the fraction of the poor versus the non-poor living in areas that are exposed, and the bl taller blue bars basically suggest that in many countries, more poor people, or a higher pr proportion of poor people, live in areas that are exposed to floods. Uh, but if you look in Honduras, for instance, that's one case where um, the overall or total population is more exposed. New York City uh, did a quick study, uh, not so quick, but uh, another study that looked at social vulnerability index, which is a common metric of um, overall vulnerability to hazards. And um, this was in relation to Sandy flooding. We did the same for Mumbai, looking at flooding from flash flooding in 2005. One thing I'll just quickly point out is that the census units are obviously quite different in their size. So you have this basic issue of the modifiable area unit problem, which is that your, the results of your statistical analysis may be in part determined by the size of the units you use. But in these studies, basically, I found that in New York, there was very little difference. Uh, on the left-hand side, the SOVI scores, <coughs> high scores, above zero are generally considered higher vulnerability, low scores below zero are considered lower vulnerability, and there was very little difference between um, the scores. In M Mumbai, there was slightly higher uh, scores in some of the more flood, flooded areas. So you all came to hear about uh, Houston, and I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip this part, but basically, I could not find support for the poverty exposure bias in New York City, I could find slight support for that in Mumbai. So looking at Houston, this is our, our hazards mapper. You can see the dams um, located, the dams that, in the reservoirs that caused so much damage as a result of the releases um, during the, the flood event. And this was a recent New York Times article just looking at the issue of sprawl 
and how unregulated sprawl in Houston may have contributed to some of the flooding that we saw that occurred there. And then this is um, a data set that we'll soon release called the Global Human Settlements Layer. You can already download it actually from the Joint Research Center at ISPRA, but basically it shows from 1975 to 1990 to 2000 to 2014 the growth in built up areas in Houston. Uh, here you see uh, impervious surface um, proportion of each census unit, in this case census tract, in the center, and then you have race, uh, white population proportion, and household income on the left and right. So um, I'm quickly running out of time here, but I'll wrap up quickly. Um, so uh, what you see, what we found basically in Houston was if you look at census tract level, block group level, or only for Houston proper, which is at the bottom, basically in each case uh, what we find is that there's lower percentages of blacks, Hispanics, and higher percentages of white and high income groups or higher income in those areas that were flooded. Uh, by contrast, there's slightly higher um, uh, that we found that at least at the block group level, there are slightly higher percentages of uh, elderly populations in those flooded areas. Uh, we tested just to see if there were income differences between flooded and non-flooded um, areas, and basically there's higher income in the higher percent flooded units. So by conclusion, I would just like to say that um, essentially this was a flood disaster that was an equal opportunity or maybe even a reverse discrimination a flood event, and that uh, means simply that uh, at least in terms of the classic um, indicators, percent African American, percent Hispanic uh, income, uh, they all seem to be negatively co correlated with flood extent in this example. So I will stop there. And uh, if there's time, I'll take any questions. Thank you. We do, have a, we do have a minute or two for questions, if we have questions. Okay, so most of these were dated around 2010, census, yeah. So we, uh, the income data, by the way, were only available for the census track level, so we could not obtain those for the higher. That's because they come from the census, whereas the other, there are variables that you can get more regularly from the ACS, American Community Survey, but those variables uh, also come with higher error bars around them, especially when you go down to the block group level. So you have to be careful about that when you do any kind of micro level analysis. Thank you. Alex? Okay. Sure. Okay. So while we load the next presentation, I'll welcome up the next speaker, Yanis Gadaris. And He's going to be talking on accessibility assessment of Houston's roadway network during Harvey. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, today I'll talk uh, about uh, accessibility analysis of uh, the uh, Houston road transportation network during Harvey. And I would like to mention that this uh, study is a disciplinary, disciplinary, interdisciplinary effort between different uh, research groups in the Department of Civil Engineering at Rice University. And I would like to acknowledge uh, my uh, colleagues and co authors, uh, Avanti Kagori and Paranaves Panakal, graduate students, Andrew Juan uh, Postok, and professors Jamie Pazent and uh, Phil Bidient. Uh, as you may, uh, as you like already know, uh, Harvey had a tremendous impact uh, in Houston, uh, where like a lot of houses and neighborhoods were like uh, severely impacted by by flood. And what made it even worse was that a, a, a very extensive part of the uh, road network was uh, significantly flooded, resulting in uh, uh, a, lo a big big portion of the population to be stranded and not accessible during the storm. 
And you can see here uh, on the left uh, a photo of uh, uh, the extent of flooding of one of the most uh, major highways in Houston, uh, 610. And on the right, uh, like uh, a photo of a residential Houston Road, which practically was converted during a massive lake uh, during the storm. And that prompted and uh, motivated us to perform the study to assess uh, the vulnerability of uh, the road uh, network and pinpoint uh, critical uh, uh, routes for emergency response that are highly vulnerable. And uh, I'll briefly talk about uh, our methodology. In our methodology, we uh, used a hybrid approach, proposed a hybrid approach to combine different types of data. Uh, first of all, uh, we used uh, uh, some observed flooded uh, data from Texas DOT, which reported uh, portions of major highways that were like closed and flooded during the storm for different time instants. And but. Texas DOD didn't, didn't, did not report, it. we didn't have information about smaller local roads in uh, uh, neighborhoods in Houston. And that's why we used uh, some hydrologic and hydraulic modeling in order to estimate and the, uh, infer which ones of these local roads were um, uh, flooded and closed. So uh, we performed hydrologic, unsteady hydrology and hydraulic modeling and we created the flat plain for some smaller uh, sub-regions of Houston and we uh, consider that uh, any roads that the f uh, water surface level uh, uh, was above two feet were flooded and inaccessible. So by combining these two um, types of data uh, we were able to uh, construct our uh, uh, network and also know which parts, which road links were flooded and not accessible. And that allowed us to perform accessibility analysis and especially pinpoint how operable, how functional were critical routes for uh, rescue crews and, med and access to medical services during the storm. So as I mentioned, we used two types of data. The first one were observed empirical data from Texas DOT. Uh, here we can see uh, the major uh, highway network in Houston and with like the uh, orange lines are the flooded and not accessible roads. And we had this information for different time instants uh, during the storm. And uh, then we used this hydrologic and uh, uh, hydraulic modeling for a sub-region in particular. In our, case, in our case study, we focused on the Brace Bayou watershed, which is a very densely populated watershed with more than 95% developed land, which historically has been very vulnerable to river and flooding, and millions of dollars have invested in flood infrastructure in the 60s. And it's shown here in the southwest part of Houston in this figure. And I'll briefly uh, discuss a little bit uh, the, the modeling part. Uh, so the input for the models was uh, Rainfall Level 2 NEXRAD uh, radar data, which were input for the hydrologic HEC uh, HMS model, which simulate uh, flows at the sub-basin level. And then these flows, uh, which were the output of the hydrologic model, were the input to the hydraulic and static HEC uh, RAS model, which generates uh, uh, water surface elevations. And then using some ArcGIS analysis, we were able to create the flat plane of the region, as you can see in the schematic uh, here. Uh, and here are some uh, validation results here for the hydrologic model. Uh, and this figure show in the vertical axis the discharge with respect to time in the horizontal axis for some gauges uh, so along the, the water side that's shown here. Uh, and uh, the, blue, uh, the, the gray lines are the model results and the, the black uh, dots are the uh, uh, observed uh, from the gauges. So we can see that we have very good agreement uh, both in terms of volume as well as uh, in terms of uh, the timing of uh, the evolution of the storm and the flows. And here similarly are some hydraulic validation results on the vertical axis of these figures for the different gauges along uh, the water set are the stage elevations uh, with respect to time and again good uh, results both in terms of uh, uh, amplitude as well as in terms of uh, time. 
And let's move now to the network, road network details. Uh, here in this figure is shown the part of the network considered uh, in comparison to the entire uh, highway network in Houston. And here we zoomed in, magnified this to talk about uh, some details. So uh, the network consisted of uh, 589 road links and 434 nodes. And from them, uh, like 33 were fire stations denoted as like the red stars in the vicinity of the K study area, and 24 were hospitals denoted as the uh, red crosses uh, also in the area of interest. And um, uh, the gray dotted the polygons corresponds to census blocks, 200, 218 census blocks were as, uh, considered, and their accessibility uh, were as, uh, was assessed. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this slide here, I'm going to uh, provide some uh, details about some results about the overall connectivity and operability of the network. So this figure shows in the vertical axis the percentage of operational, functional, origin and destination uh, paths in the entire network that we considered uh, with respect to time. So, uh, we see that uh, August 25th, uh, before the storm arrived in Houston, we had 100% operational load, so everything was working uh, as it should be. But on August 27th at 5 a.m., we have a significant drop, just 60% of the rows of the area were uh, functional, uh, not rows, like paths, the possible paths in the network, whereas during the, around the peak of the storm, the 27th, even uh, less roads, were, uh, less paths were accessible, and then eventually on August 28th, we had uh, recovered in a significant extent. But what is interesting to note is that if we consider only the part of the network Say uh, with like uh, uh, denoted with the blue uh, polygons here, which are the vicinity of the bayou, and the same results for these uh, census blocks are shown with the red dotted lines. So you can see that these areas were significantly and more severely affected, and that prompted us to look in more, into more detail on the accessibility uh, of these um, of these uh, census blocks and areas of uh, of the network. Uh, and in order to assess accessibility, we use the metric called connectivity loads, which is uh, one, and shown here, which is uh, one minus the ratio of the length of the shortest origin and destination path of the original and damaged network, network over the length of the shortest uh, origin and destination path of the compromised damaged network during the, uh, the storm. And this uh, uh, metric is an indicator of the level of both connectivity and efficiency between the origin node, uh, which can be a fire station or a hospital, and the destination node, which can be a certain uh, uh, census block. And it can have values between zero and one. Zero means that there's no loss in the connectivity and accessibility uh, between these two origin and destination, uh, this origin and destination pair, where a value of one corresponds to complete uh, connectivity loss. So there's no way to move from origin to destination at all. And here are some results uh, for the connectivity loss between fire stations, which are the origin, and the census blocks that we consider, which are destination, for three different instances in time during the storm, and which this origin destination pair is a route necessary for rescue crews to assess uh, the impact of populations. So you can see at August 27 at 5 a.m. that a big portion of uh, the census block with the red uh, shows uh, that uh, the um, connectivity loss was between 75 and 100 percent so severely impacted and uh, not connected with uh, uh, fire stations. And as we move to 5 p.m., we see more uh, blocks are uh, uh, having this severe disconnectivity. And it's interesting to note that uh, as we go from like earlier in the storm, more of them were like on the west part of the city, where it's the upstream part of the water scent. And as uh, the flows moved to the downstream to the east, the impact uh, flooded areas were moved uh, also here. And finally, on August 28th, pretty much this, uh, uh, the connectivity was restored and uh, like the networks uh, coming back to normal. 
And here is uh, similar uh, results, but in this case, uh, we I'm showing the, the connectivity loss between census blocks and hospitals, which are route necessary for impact populations to access medical services. And same pattern as before uh, is observed uh, uh, between during the storm, so around 5 p.m. I will have severely in the uh, populate, uh, severely impacted uh, non-accessible areas in the middle of um, uh, the water set. And in conclusion. Uh, this study performed an accessibility assessment of Houston's road network during Harvey uh, and implement, it was implemented for a case study region, in particular Brace by U Watershed. And a hybrid methodology was observed uh, for this study that used both different types of data, both observed and model road flooding condition data. And this type of analysis can facilitate vulnerability assessment of routes necessary for emergency support that can support identification of highly vulnerable lifeline routes for preemptive mitigation strategies. And some future work could, uh, that we want to do is to extend the methodology to other uh, Houston watersheds, investigate social vulnerability dimension uh, by considering demographics of the impact areas, incorporate the flood related road damage data, and ultimately formulate a hybrid framework for urban flooding accessibility and recovery assessment that integrates various types of data, such as empirical, analytical, and damage data. Uh, and also we want to incorporate uncertainty so we can have can be able to perform probabilistic analysis. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One quick question. So, first of all, for the local roads, which we didn't have observed data for uh, the Department of Transportation and the other source, we assume that if on this road the level of uh, the inundation depth was, was two feet and above, we considered it closed, inaccessible, that it was not safe to drive. And during the network analysis, the accessibility was the ratio of the length of the shortest path between the original network over the Damas network. So for the Damas network, yeah. because different links were like were not available anymore, were closed, there would be a longer length. And if there was no connection at all, that means that we had 100% yes, connectivity loss. It's not switching on. Oh. All right, we have one more quick question. Alex. Uh, yes, so has the Alex. Uh, yeah, so we haven't, uh, that's a very recent study, we haven't uh, presented these results to the DOT uh, yet, but the recommendations would be to pinpoint some very critical routes or some yeah. existing emergency response routes uh, that uh, the, the state or the department has already identified that should be operable and check what was the level of connectivity loss. So if these were particularly vulnerable, that could be an indication to uh, to do me measures for like uh, faster draining of these roads or protect them during the flood, to, re to remain them open so uh, rescue crews can access these uh, like destinations. So from these origins, these uh, parts of this, uh, the town, we can reach easily uh, medical services such as hospitals. Okay, I think we need to move on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now welcome Jacek Radzikowski from George Mason with a rather intriguing title. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Uh, good morning, everybody. I would like to tell you today about uh, what, what can you do when a disaster strikes to get the message out. Uh, so what, 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 have you do, what have you do in case of uh, a disaster? First of all, make sure that you are safe, that your friends, your family, you are safe. The next thing you do, you, you have to t let everybody know that uh, what, what happened? That, a disaster, that there is a disaster that people need help. So what can you do? 
Uh, and uh, well, first of all, everybody does is reaching for cell phone. Okay, but what if uh, the cell network doesn't work? What do you do? Surprisingly, this is what you will hear from many people. But uh, unfortunately, they are wrong. When the cell, phone, cell network works, uh, doesn't work, the internet doesn't work either because uh, internet uses cell, ne cell network. In, in your phone, internet uses cell network as the carrier. And if the cell network doesn't work, most likely also the wired networks don't work. So you don't have internet access. You cannot post on Facebook. Uh, and it's not that cell networks uh, crash whenever they can. They are built to be robust. They are built to sustain a lot. And because this, this is the business of cell network operators, to provide connectivity. So it's in their interest to build a network as robust, as uh, stable as possible. However, there are limits. They have to balance out how much they're go going to spend on the network to make it robust. Uh, and uh, they are very reluctant to spend too much. There is a, uh, a long ongoing uh, discussion with cell network operators and FCC on the backup power since the Sandy Times. And this has been brought again uh, uh, when Hurricane uh, Harvey struck. But not only cell network can crash not only because of uh, natural disasters. Human disasters also can, make, uh, can br uh, bring it to halt. Like, for example, big gathering of people. Uh, this year there was in Chicago a gathering of fans of Pokemon Go, and the network died. Nobody had connectivity. So what can you do? Uh, well, there are some solutions. You can get some cheap uh, walkie-talkies. You can get satellite phone, you can get satellite beacons, but they have limitations. Uh, Walkie-talkies, they are great uh, if you want to communica communicate with your family, with your uh, friends, uh, within the community. Uh, satellite beacons, they have very limited uh, capabilities. Uh, satellite phones, uh, well, they're expensive, uh, not everybody can afford it. And first of all, you have to have someone to call. So if you're going to contact your uh, local emergency center and uh, there is a disaster that you need a satellite phone, most likely they don't have phone either. And of course, you need to know how to use these devices. When the sky falls on your head, it's not time to, look, to read the instruction manual. And uh, so what should be effective method for uh, communication in case of disaster? First of all, it should work on local, regional, and interregional levels, provide reliable communication channel in spite of commercial power failure. So for example, you should have uh, backup generators, you, should have, you can have solar power. Uh, do not depend on infra infrastructure which may or may not exist. Uh, be easy to deploy on a very short notice. You cannot wait uh, two weeks for someone to bring a container with portable cell station when people are dying uh, around. And uh, should not pose uh, additional workload on people who are already involved in rescue operations and are, are over, already overloaded with work. And I have good news for you. Such a solution exists. An ancient hobby of amateur radio. So what is amateur radio? In short, this is a, uh, a name a help for people who are interested uh, in communication over radio. Uh, and uh, it, it is regulated by regulations if, issued by FCC, and one of the statutory goals is providing emergency communication. Uh, and people who, uh, the, the shortest name for, for people who are involved in radio communication, uh, for amateur radio communicators, is that they are trained communicators. And then this trained communicators think, I want to remember, because this will uh, come very crash important later on in the presentation. So yeah, amateur radio is that hobby. Not really. Uh, currently, there are over 700 uh, thousand uh, issued licenses in the United States and the number is growing. The graph you can see here, these are numbers from 
uh, FCC. So you can see that it's nowhere uh, close getting to, to being that. Uh, the distribution of the licenses shown on this map here is more or less follows uh, distribution of the population in the United States. So there is a good chance that in your neighborhood there's someone who uh, has radio in their house. And of course, not all these people are active, but even if 25% uh, are active, it is still a, a very big number. So how, how they are used? Well, these people not only sit and talk with each other, they are actually, when, when there is a need, they actually get actively involved uh, in, uh, in uh, rescue operations. So when Hurricane uh, in uh, Katrina struck uh, New Orleans, these people organized communication between hospitals. And this was that effective that after the event, some of the employees of the hospitals actually decided to get their own license to quickly set up station whenever there's a need. Uh, the, and this is not only Hurric uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, amateur radio operators were involved in operations in, uh, in Nepal, in uh, the Haiti, and also this year in many rescue operations uh, after the hurricanes. So what makes amateur radio so successful in uh, such operations? Well, the, uh, the service has many allocations of uh, frequencies which are allocated only for them. There are some on, on secondary basis, but many allocations are assigned only for the service. Uh, some of these frequencies allow for easy, very easy interoperability with FEMA or military. Uh, and there are, through the year, there are many training events uh, which allow to get communic uh, obtain communication skills, polish them, and learn how to communicate with professional agencies like FEMA or MARS, the military uh, radio network. So how does it work? On local level, it's very easy. This is pretty much the same as uh, the walkie-talkies, very similar to the walkie-talkies that you can get uh, in, your, uh, in, in a store. These are people with walkie-talkies which can talk to each other. Uh, and their range of communication is within uh, single kilometers. If you need longer, co uh, bigger coverage, you can set up a device repeating the signal called repeater, and then you have coverage in, tens of, uh, in range of tens of kilometers. So for regional level, uh, you can shoot the signal straight in the sky, and this will actually bounce off the ionosphere, and this allows you to reach regions which are not accessible otherwise, because the signal comes from the sky. So if you have a mountain, have no mountain, it's not a problem. On interregional level, again, ionosphere comes to the rescue, you can shoot towards the horizon, it bounces off an ionosphere, can bounce again from the ground, again from the ionosphere, or travel in the ionosphere, and you can reach uh, stations even thousands of kilometers away. And this came, came very handy when they, uh, in Puerto Rico. So almost entire communication was that. Uh, American Red Cross reached to uh, people, uh, requested help from people, 300 people responded, only uh, they selected 50 people. Uh, when they went to Puerto Rico, it turned out that actually they have to organize any communication. There was absolutely no communication there, and what was uh, supposed to be just helping people get out message turned out to be building, uh, mission of building communication. Uh, the communication was between uh, remote station and uh, San Juan and between San Juan and uh, stations in the United States. Many people in the United States actually devoted their stations only for this communication. Uh, so this is where the trained communication part became very uh, important. Uh, in, so, in, so, in some hospitals, people thought, uh, well, some hospitals had fully equipped uh, communication rooms and no one to use them, who, who knew who used them. So what I would like you to remember from this uh, presentation, first of all, amateur radio is not dead and uh, amateur radio operators can provide communication whenever there is uh, a need. Uh, sometimes, these uh, strange people with antennas uh, in their backyards, they may be your only 
uh, way of communication, and it is, right now they may be saving somebody's life. Low-tech low -tech solution works very well, and if you've got interest, get licensed, get involved. Thank you. We have time for a question or two? Yes. Yes. You can use batteries and you can use batteries. You can use solar power. And uh, actually, people who uh, want, who are involved in emergency communication, they have, they are very well equipped. They have backup generators. They have everything what is necessary to uh, organize communication on a very short notice, even without commercial power. Yes. It doesn't depend on the price. It depends on uh, uh, frequency that you use. And uh, you can get very cheap devices. If you know Morse code, you can get something costing like 10, 20 bucks and still get the message out 1,000 kilometers away. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. OK, our next talk is being given by Andrew Moulton. In your program, it says Jordan Bell. <laughs> but Andrew uh, and a range of NASA colleagues. Uh. Yeah, good morning, and uh, thank you for coming to the session this morning to hear about uh, a variety of activities that we've been working on. I'm here to talk about NASA's uh, Earth Science Disasters Program response activities during Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria in 2017. And um, as the uh, <coughs> chair mentioned, I'm Andrew Moulton. I'm a research meteorologist in the Earth Science branch at NASA Marshall in Huntsville. Uh, before we get too far, I want to thank a long list of co-authors, and there's probably some people on here who uh, also aren't listed, but we had a broad team of folks from a variety of NASA centers, uh, academic partners, uh, the NASA DAX, et cetera, that contributed a large volume of data, uh, unique products, and support for these various events. We also have the um, benefit of working with the USGS and the Hazardous Data Distribution System to collect additional data sets and help produce products both to hand back to them and also to hand to end users. A lot of our data also uh, comes from collaborators with, within uh, ESA, including the availability of the Sentinel uh, series of satellites with a significant focus on the synthetic aperture radar available from Sentinel-1A and 1B. Um, just for some background for those that aren't familiar, within the NASA uh, Earth Science and Applied Science Program, uh, they've established a disaster response team process. So the way this works within NASA is that when a significant disaster event occurs, whether that's a uh, wildfire, flood, hurricane, earthquake, or even something uh, or, uh, based upon technology, our team gets together for what we call a rapid assessment to figure out what products we have available, who the likely end users are, the timeliness of those data sets, and how to respond. Uh, within our broad uh, group of NASA centers and affiliated partners, we assign a lead coordinator, and that coordinator works with individual NASA field centers and academic partners to bring together the expertise throughout the agency and then lend that support to end users, primarily focused on the immediate disaster response activities, but also longer term thinking about how these products can be used for recovery and mitigation of future disaster events. In 2017, NASA's Earth Science Disaster Response Team uh, had a significant focus on the three major hurricanes that had significant impacts in the United States. A lot of these efforts focus on those partnerships with USGS and HDDS, uh, the International Charter on Space and Major Disasters, um, other data sources that are available through NASA, NOAA, and commercial partners, and feeding that data to these end users so they can use the analysis that comes from these sensors to um, beef up their own support to map the uh, impacts and support recovery and um, <clears throat> work with us over time to improve processes for both, part for, uh, both NASA and these partners going forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to talk through a few examples of various products that NASA has provided to partners, then we'll summarize with some timelines these various events. Uh, perhaps one of the uh, satellites that's most well known uh, this past season for uh, hurricane forecasting response is a global precipitation measurement mission, uh, GPM, and a, a broader constellation of passenger microwave supporting satellites uh, map precipitation throughout the world. In the upper left, you see examples of um, basically the convective structure of hurricanes Harvey and Irma. Uh, passenger microwave brightness temperature 
temperatures are nice and that they allow us to see through some of the central dense overcast of these large storms, make it easier to see the internal eye wall structure and the center of circulation. And that data is provided routinely to the National Weather Service, and the National Hurricane Center, and partners at the Naval Research Lab. Uh, the bottom two uh, capture other GPM capabilities to map the three-dimensional structure of precipitation within storms. That often helps us longer term to understand the processes that lead to uh, rapid intensification, heavy rainfall, and uh, other effects. And on the bottom right, it captures a, a product called iMERGE, which maps precipitation, in this case highlighting the uh, pink and magenta bullseye of record-setting rainfall in southeastern Texas that can shoot it to the flooding we've seen highlighted in other presentations this morning. Along with that precipitation comes the ability to map soil moisture. Uh, NASA's Soil Moisture Active Passive, or SMAP mission, uh, captures land surface change in soil moisture characteristics resulting from heavy rainfall. Uh, the top graphic there shows soil moisture that has uh, increased significantly across the southeastern Texas area as a result of the heavy rain. And being able to map the excess of soil moisture over time uh, and include it in models such as that highlighted below shows us where um, areas of flooding are more likely. So we. We have an interest in using both real-time data and analysis to show people the current state of conditions, but also synthesize that data with other data sets and physical models to produce a more comprehensive and uh, a comprehensive picture that also provides us an ability to forecast into the future. Um, <clears throat> along with just monitoring the precipitation, soil moisture, and rainfall, we need to be able to support end users in mapping specific impacts from flooding. We saw an earlier presentation about you know, the need to understand where water is because that impacts a lot of infrastructure, access, and uh, overall response. Uh, key to this often with uh, hurricanes or slow moving storms like Harvey is the ability to use synthetic aperture radar as the active type of radar allows uh, for the most part to penetrate through the clouds and see some of the signatures corresponding to uh, deep standing water resulting from those floods. Uh, so this is a top left an example from the JPL ARIA team looking at data highlighting uh, flooding in southeastern Texas in the Houston metro. Uh, the top right is uh, work that our Marshall team did in collaboration with the Alaska Satellite Facility, continuing to map flooding, but also looking at uh, multi-spectral or multi-color uh, composites that help uh, confirm some of that flood visually with some of the uh, color callouts in that false color nature. Um, in the middle, there's a, a different approach here taken where the JPL ARIA team is able to use a synthetic aperture radar and scenes over time to look at uh, change that's a result of damage from the hurricane in terms of uh, winds and other effects. So this is helpful to help map uh, structural damage from hurricanes, earthquakes, etc. And uh, the bottom left is an example specific to Houston where because the uh, flooding was so significant, large, and fast moving over the 7 to 12 day period. Uh, NASA actually provided UAV SAR flights, or essentially a SAR system mounted on the belly of an airplane, that went through and was able to map that day by day and really track the fine detail of that flood wave as it moved through the Houston area. And uh, bottom right there is a bit hard to see, probably from the back, there's a lot of different colored squares. Each of those footprints reflects a product generated by our team. Uh, using either uh, publicly available or the international charter, charter data, mapping these flood extents with those products going to FEMA and being used by them uh, in their own reporting to document the impacts of the event. Along with synthetic aperture radar, uh, optical remote sensing still plays a role. Uh, cloud cover can be a bit of a pain with these big events, but as the sky is clear, optical provides uh, sometimes higher resolution data or products that help confirm what we're seeing in other data sets. Uh, our team worked collaboratively throughout NASA, including uh, collaborators at Marshall and the NASA Severe Program, to use uh, charter data and commercial assets to map uh, water extent at a higher spatial resolution. So that was key to helping map um, turbid waters, flood waters, and other impacts in the Houston area. And uh, it turns out that um, given the large volume of optical data, there's always an opportunity to use higher resolution, higher resolution sensors uh, to supplement SAR and other analysis for these major flood events. <clears throat> a little bit longer term, uh, beyond just the impact uh, of the primary flooding, this is looking at uh, a little bit different event, looking at now Maria and the significant impacts that Maria had to Puerto Rico and the ongoing impacts that Maria has had on the electrical infrastructure. Um, earlier we looked at uh, road networks as, as uh, a key component for response. Uh, Puerto Rico ex experienced such widespread uh, devastation to their electrical infrastructure that there was significant loss of light and the SUMI NPP Veers day-night band, uh, now continued with NOAA's uh, latest launch of JPSS, uh, provides detection of nighttime lights that uh, essentially capture human activity 
uh, wildfires, lightning, et cetera. In this case, um, a team at NASA Goddard produced a downscaled version of that day-night band product, which uh, shows neighborhood scale lights on the order of about 30 meters spatial resolution. And so this imagery between the left and the right captures those changes. And in the bottom, uh, day-night band imagery is provided to the National Guard, and they used it to inform some of their response activities, staging of resources and security issues. Uh, so I'll go through a few quick timelines pretty briefly and then summarize. Uh, Hurricane Harvey, we kicked off in uh, late August as the storm approached the United States. Uh, Hurricane Center makes use of GPM data regularly, while the team, as the flooding occurred uh, inland, produced maps routinely over multiple days. Uh, eventually, <clears throat> in early September, we in implemented the UAVSAR flights, which were crucial to supporting the state of Texas and mapping the rapid evolution of the flooding. And going on as the events uh, continued, you know, interest turned to some longer term impacts of power outages from um, Harvey as well to see how that Veer's Day Night Bank can capture that in recovery. With Irma, Irma was a bit uh, faster moving storm, a bit different than the other two, had significant impacts of course to, of course, to uh, Florida. Uh, basically the entire uh, state of Florida I think was impacted by some aspect of severe winds and uh, also even parts of Alabama including Huntsville were impacted by some aspect of Herma. Um, <clears throat> A lot of the same uh, ideas here, the G GPM data crucial for mapping the location of the storm. Uh, Irma's uh, rap more rapid progression uh, perhaps made flooding less of an issue, but we did go ahead and use SAR maps to map the extent of those, uh, along with uh, using the damage proxy maps with ARIA to map the impacts of the hurricane itself and its strong winds. Uh, we had some unique opportunities to gather International Space Station imagery for the affected area, but those could be used as well. And uh, GPM provided a nice map there of the uh, long track of the storm and the heavy rainfall that occurred throughout the Caribbean and into the United States. Uh, Maria is probably a, <clears throat> a unique storm just given the longevity of our response activities. Uh, as with the other events, you know, GPM and other constellation data were certainly helpful in monitoring the storm. Uh, we had some colleagues at the University of Maryland who assisted us by predicting uh, flood, flood and inundation extent given the heavy rainfall and other impacts in Puerto Rico. Uh, the long-term loss of electrical infrastructure is a unique aspect of Maria, and our team spent uh, several days, weeks, and now months looking at the power outages, and uh, folks at Goddard continue to look at that from a scientific perspective to understand the broader use of VIRS data and NASA products in monitoring recovery. So in summary, our Earth Science Disaster Response Team provides you know, numerous products and assistance for these types of events. We also uh, have other presentations here this week talking about our activities related to earthquakes, fires, and other efforts. Our collaborations with other NASA centers and partners are uh, crucial for engaging with end users uh, to leverage this remote sensing expertise. And our ongoing and future activities will continue to build those collaborations, focusing on GIS services, uh, training, and other needs to make this a successful endeavor. Uh, finally, if you have any uh, questions, there's a couple of quick web links you can view uh, on your favorite browser or smartphone. Uh, my co contact information is there, and I've been joined in the audience by David Green, our program manager for the Applied Science Disasters Program. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Time for a question or two? Uh, the, one of the great stories, I think, from the NASA Earth Science Disasters team over the last couple of years has been the increased engagement with FEMA over time. Um, probably the first few events we engaged with, we were doing some products via FTP and we get some feedback. Uh, for this event, you know, I showed a few different slides where our products and these footprints on these slides are basically showing where FEMA is taking the products and maps that our NASA team produces. They use them daily in their own briefings and the synthesis of their own recovery information. And because of FEMA's broad reach in the disasters community, uh, you know, those products are in turn used by others. So through our ability to collaborate with them, respond to the, the needs that they have, provide training and context for the data, and sustain partnerships over time that are, you know, trusted in that area, I think in the last, you know, year to 18 months, we've been able to really have some good progress in that area. Uh, <clears throat> we actually have a FEMA colleague here this week who has a poster, and a, a, I think maybe even today, uh, to talk more about that. Thank you, Andrew. So our next presentation is Social Media for Real-Time Disaster Management by Chen Ying Kwan from Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, 
Thank you all for coming here. I'm very glad to be here present my recent work on uh, developing a real-time disaster management system based on social media data sets. This is my outline. So as we know, social media data are widely used in disaster management in various aspects. For example, as a platform to support real-time dissemination of information. Um, as, uh, also as a new data source to establish situation awareness. For example, during a disaster, people may treat information about uh, impact, uh, damage, uh, volunteer, donation, all those information are very useful to establish situation awareness. Also as a new media to support the back channel communication, when the official resource data are not available, reachable within the impact community. However, among the massive social media data sets generated during the natural hazard, only a small portion of them are useful and relevant that can be used to uh, establishment of the social, uh, situational awareness. Therefore, in order to quickly extract, extract such useful information, uh, we rely on natural language processing and machine learning machine learning technologies. For example, commonly caution advice, fatality, injury, offer, volunteer, damage, request, and offer such information are widely extracted and identified. As we know, during the disaster management, it includes four integrated uh, stages or phases from mitigation, preparedness, response, and uh, finally to the recovery. However, the social media data are primarily used for the disaster response uh, stage, sometimes also utilized for the recovery stage. Unfortunately, useful information posted before the disaster about how to better prepare the disaster and after a disaster are mostly ignored and not extracted. Therefore, the objective for this research is first how to define a code schema or classification schema that uh, considering the message in different disaster stages such as preparedness, response, and recovery. And the second, how to build a common classification model that can automatically identify and categorize the social media data into different topics during different disaster events. And in different, different disaster stages as well. Finally, develop a spatial web portal visualization system to help us check and monitor the disaster through the social media data to support the real-time disaster management. So here is the workflow of, my, of the proposed, to develop the proposed system. The first step is to develop the code or classification schema by examining the social media data literally posted within a disaster events, followed by the classification model development. It is to note, in order to make sure the classification model developed based on one event can also work on other events, so useful information can uh, retrieve the real timely. We utilize one event data as to build the model, in this case is Hurricane Sandy, and they utilize the data generated from many other events to verify and improve the model to make sure the model will work on different similar events. And after that, I, uh, we can utilize the spatial web portal to visualize and analyze the data in a real-time fashion. So as mentioned, we utilize Hurricane Sandy as the um, uh, training data sets and also test data sets in order to make sure that we understand the nature of social media data posted during the disaster and make sure you, we capture all the potential topics or themes discussed during the disaster. We uh, purchased all the 
geotag the social media dates, uh, uh, tweets from uh, uh, the GNAP pr data provider within the Hurricane Sandy data period within the uh, New York City area. In the end, we retrieve about 1.8 uh, geotag the tweets. Among the most uh, um, relevant uh, hashtag related to uh, Hurricane Sandy, we utilize 52 of them to retrieve relevant hurricane events. It's about 50,000. Within the 50,000 tweets, we utilize uh, 11,000 uh, as samples to train and test the classification model. Also, we utilize recent hurricane events data to validate and improve the classification model. Uh, we utilize the Twitter stream and the search APIs to access the data in, the, in, in two months. Here is the different uh, uh, data, the data sets for different events. And since my focus is geographic data and also to establish geographic situation awareness, I utilize only the geotag data to validate and improve the classification model. So after examining about 11,000 geotag tweets, we notice and uh, define the categories or topics discussed within the preparedness as follows, including something like how to prepare the disaster, plans for evacuation, shelter stock up, prepare the outage, and uh, the, the tips to, to better uh, prepare the disaster and also event checking. Here is the, a set of uh, major themes or topics discussed during the response stage, such as clean up, organizations, housing, food, and the power. Here you may notice the impact is one major types of response information category. So under the impact, we notice there are several major themes and the topics discussed as well, including casualty, work, communication, uh, heating, gas, water, such uh, damage, flooding as well. So here is the major topics we uh, define during the recovery stage. Before we can utilize the text message posted in the social media into the classification model, we need some initial data processing steps Besides the common used steps for tax mining, such as remove non-English message, tokenization, remove the spatial characters, stop words such as we and are, which literally utilize in many message. So they are not useful to contribute to the classification. And the one specific uh, steps I wanted to direct your attention here is remove any events related keywords, uh, such as Sandy, New York, because those uh, events keyword related uh, be, uh, cannot be helpful to develop a common classifier that can build based on, on one it, events can be applied for many other, other events. So here we utilize the uh, Apache Mount uh, machine learning package, test various machine learning, uh, machine learning algorithm to identify the, to identify the method for the um, message classification. In the end, we notice that uh, logistical regression has a better performance, therefore are selected for the classification tasks. Uh, the performance actually is, is quite promising. After we remove the event-specific keywords, which is very important to build a common classification, our uh, model actually have, have achieved a reasonable performance with about a 70% of accuracy 
and the recall about uh, 72 percentage, which is reasonable to extract the relevant information during the uh, natural hazard. Just in case you are interested, here is the classification uh, performance of different uh, topics in different uh, stage. For example, we achieve a very good uh, performance for classified uh, flood relevant uh, uh, tweets, uh, rescue post sandy clean up, and the relief relevant information during the recovery stage. Actually, the, the accuracy is more than 90 percentage for those categories. Here, uh, I will quickly show a demo to, 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 uh, to, to visualize the result uh, for using the portal to, to see, uh, see the topics and the categories discussed uh, all the social media in different uh, stages. And uh, basically here you can select a disaster event and uh, select the relevant topic. Then you can able to see the spatial temporal pattern of the message in different uh, stages. And besides, besides uh, the general search, utilize the, uh, the, the, the category, you can also further narrow down your search with the different uh, um, information, such as the date, time, and also keywords information. Well, I will quickly draw a conclusion uh, first, uh, coding or classification schema is developed to categorize or classify the social media message into different topics during different disaster stage. Text mining algorithms are tested and used to categorize the collected tweets in different events. Logistic reg regression is uh, selected to build the common class classifier for different disaster events. Eventually, a spatial web portal is developed to visualize and analyze the classification result. As a future research, there are many potential directions. The first one I would like to fo focus on uh, recently is improve the pre performance of the classification um, by integrating the the features more than just the text, such as the location where the trees are posted from, and also further explore the emotion and the movement pattern of the users who contribute the message of situation awareness during different disaster stage. And I'm also quite interested to analyze the spatial patterns of uh, social media in different subset of uh, category, such as evacuation, power outage, and uh, also link with other GIS data to understand the reasons or drivers behind those spatial temporal patterns. Taking this opportunity, I would like to thank the uh, agencies to sponsor the uh, project and my collaborators and uh, students. Thank you all. Oh, if there is a time for questions, I would Thank you. welcome to you. The feedback and the questions. If we have one very quick question. Yeah. So basically, I utilize the events uh, from recent Hurricane Harvey and, uh, and also the uh, Irma Maria. So basically, I manually label them and utilize them to utilize the class of classifier to test them for validation. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, our next talk explores how prepared Puerto Rico was in advance of Hurricane Maria, and uh, Elizabeth Benacourt will be giving it. Hi.
Good morning. I'm going to talk to you today about what happened to the Puerto Rico Seismic Network during and in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Um, now, to explain to us all, I know a lot of people here are not seismologists, so you might not even know what Puerto Rico Seismic Network is. I thought I'd explain about what our essential functions are. We are an Amer advanced national seismic system network, so we have the same responsibilities as the California networks and the Washington State networks as far as seism seismic events are concerned. But additionally, we also act as a tsunami warning focal point alternate for Puerto Rico. So we also have tsunami responsibility. To put things in perspective, the last tsunami in Puerto Rico was in 1918. So in as far as our essential functions for maintaining continuity of operations is the one, first of all, primarily the real-time monitoring of seismic events on the island. Secondly, to disseminate that information to the public and emergency managers in the region, not just to Puerto Rico, but also to the Virgin U.S. and British Virgin Islands. Um, we also assist the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in the assessment of the local threats of tsunamis in the region. And we also must we maintain our compliance with the requirements and responsibilities as set by UNESCO for the, being the alternate tsunami warning focal point for Puerto Rico. And this comes into play much a little bit later in the talk. Um, the Puerto Rico Seismic Network is not just a seismic network. Um, I, in my opinion, it would be more appropriate to call it an earthquake center or maybe a plate boundary observatory. To the north, we have the Puerto Rico Trench, which requires an active subduction zone, which we monitor. Uh, but we also, if I look at our instrumentation, we have seismic instruments, GPS instruments. We're also responsible for um, tide gauges, both our own, and we help NOAA with maintenance of other tide gauges in the region. And we also have some accelerometers that we have, uh, that we do have, use in the general time and for, our, uh, for our analysis. Um, this is what I'm showing here is our current, or is our normal distribution of instrumentations we are responsible for, but we also use instrumentation that's available from the Dominican Republic as well as other islands to the south of um, the, the figure I'm showing here. Now, as far as our individual sites, I mentioned we have different types of instrumentation. For a seismic instrument, um, we, for all of our seismic, oh, for our seismic instruments, we have the site infrastructure, we have all of our seismic instruments into um, concrete vaults, which is what I'm showing in the upper left-hand picture. But those vaults are sealed concrete vaults, which are dig down into the earth about a few, couple, two to three meters. Uh, as far as our GPS, our GPSs are following Navco standards. So those are drilled in with tripods and well, essentially welded into spots for our GPS monuments. Our tide gauges, of course, are near the coast, um, which puts them into extreme danger as far as damages for things like storm surge due to hurricanes. Um, but also, it's, the other critical thing I want to point out is our radio and our communications infrastructure. Our communications and power infrastructure, for showing this lower right, we typically have an antenna with our solar panel attached to it that we have a mix of radio communications, a lot, many internet stations, as well as AT&T mobile data. Now, what happened during Hurricane Irma and Maria? I have to say both here because our AOR, our area of responsibility, includes both the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So essentially our network, as far as infrastructure, got a one-two punch. We had the first round come with Maria, we had a Category 5 hit the Virgin Islands and take out a number of our, of our stations there. And then on September 20th, Maria came and hit Puerto Rico, which hit the rest of our infrastructure and also again hit the Virgin Islands once again already already hitting, already weakened infrastructure. So what happened to our network? I classify our failures into three different categories. The primary failure was the total collapse of the Puerto Rico communications and power infrastructure. And if I think it's in perspective for the communications, in the Puerto Rico seismic network, we have a FEMA NAWA system. That system is supposed to, uh, supposed to ex um, last through things like a nuclear blast. It's supposed to never go down. Our NAWA system went down during the hurricane. We also lost our NOAA radio. Those are those two federal systems which are never supposed to go down. And as far as just our radio communications, we have radio with our local emergency managers. Um, uh, what I'm showing on the map is a line, and that line goes from roughly from Arecibo to Ponce. To the west of the line, we could talk on radio to each other. And to the east of the line, they could talk to the radio to each other. But we could not talk east-west across the island on radio because we lost a repeater in the center of the island. 
So essentially what happened was Puerto Rico Seismic Network became the only tsunami warning focal point for the western side of the island. As I said earlier, we were alternate. The other two tsunami warning focal points on the island are both based in San Juan at the National Weather Service and the State Emergency Management Headquarters, which are both in San Juan region. The secondary failure that we had, and this is where most of our damage, physical damage comes to our network, is the communication tower structure of our Puerto Rico Seismic Network stations. As I had shown before, it was we have our solar panels and communications on a single tower. What happened, in my opinion, is during the storm, the solar panel acted like a sail. Solar panels are also heavy. Added a torque to the system and essentially pulled out and collapsed some of our, our towers. Um, what I'm showing here in the bottom right-hand corner is a picture of one of our communications tower, which was pulled out by the foundation. So the entire concrete foundation was pulled out. Um, the tertiary failure would damage the actual PRS and instruments. This is where we've gotten somewhat lucky that most of our vaults held. Um, this, this is what I'm talking about. With, we have vaults that flooded, but I'm showing this bottom center picture. We had vaults flood and destroy the instruments. Um, as soon as you get any water on a seismic instrument, it has to be replaced. And a single instrument, you're talking about $15,000 to replace a single instrument. Um, the other type of failure we had was the destruction of instruments, primarily our tide gauges. What I'm showing is a picture from the Mayaguez port, um, the lower left-hand picture, where this is showing the GPS that was there, but there was also a tide gauge there. The concrete dock that the, G the tide gauge was attached to was destroyed. Um, so the concrete docks were destroyed, and the tide gauge was about 30 meters away, or the remnants thereof. Um, we want to take a little bit more time to talk about the communications infrastructure. What I'm showing in these three pictures is on the left-hand side, I'm showing what, this, what a station, one of our typical stations, looked like beforehand. And then on the right-hand side, what, what happened to the same station after Hurricane Rhea. Now, first thing, if you look, our technical staff went to the station. It just looks like it's tipped over. You can rewrite re it up, and it'll be, can be good to go. Unfortunately, what happened, if you look, see the two supports to the solar panel, that snapped during the hurricane, and then that support punctured through our solar panel. So that solar panel now needs to be replaced. And there's no way to power that station until we can replace that solar panel. Um, so a few more pictures of some of the sites that fell down. Um, this is one of our other sites. This is where our technical staff, this was one of our older sites, they used a fiberglass tower and that just snapped. And another thing we found with a number of our radio towers, instead of just being pulled out by a foundation, is the base plate connecting to the, this concrete foundation also was pulled off. So these are the, this is our main structure that we, that we as a network can fix. Now, I just want to show this picture to let you know where we are today. This is from last Friday, so hopefully there might be a couple more stations at this point. Uh, but as last Friday, we have about half of our stations. So we are currently functioning, but we have primarily of our stations that are back are on the west southern side of the island. We have, we have no stations in the Virgin Islands that are currently operational. Um, this, and right now, we have yet to get to those stations and see the actual damages because emergency management on those islands have not given us clearance to go there yet. Um, they have taken some pictures to send some cursory damages so we know the towers that are, there are down, but we don't know if the vault is uh, sealed or not. And what does this do to our detection? Well, I'm going to show you two examples. This is, on the left-hand side, this is November of 2016 versus November of 2017. The good news is, is for significant events, events about 3.5 or larger, we still can see the events across our area responsibility. And on the west side, of the, on the west side in November 2017, you can see we're getting back to normal as far as our detections of micro seismicity, small events. However, if you look on the east side, we've lost our ability to detect the micro-seismic events. Now, this doesn't mean that we're never going to be able to see those events, because a number of our stations are actually still running. Like, we have one in Culebra, which is one of the islands right off the east of Puerto Rico. It's running. We just can't talk to it, and it can't talk to us. So what we're doing is going out, our going to get technical staff going to get the data by hand, and then my, I'm going to reanalyze that and locate all those missing events. Um, so, so one thing about this that we didn't decide to do as a network, to avoid this type of issue with our geometry, which is what is what causing this right now. We are in the plans of making our network more resilient by transferring 
some of our data, some of our stations into satellite point-to-point -point communications. We cannot afford to put our entire network on satellite point-to-point -point communications. It's a reality. The maintenance costs for even about 10 stations is thirty dollars to $40,000 a year, which is significant for our network. <laughs> so our plan is to take 10 stations that we've already pre-selected and put those onto satellite point-to-point -point communications to avoid having communication issues during hurricanes and in future events and to ensure that other partners such as PTWC and EIC receive our data consistently. Um, so beyond that, we're also going to see some hardening of our sites. The first thing we're going to do is, as I mentioned, the, the, the solar panels act like a sail and they're heavy. We're going to separate our solar panels from our communications towers. And we've come up with designs on how to install the solar panels. We're going to improve our foundations, improve the coupling. Um, we're going to be working, hopefully, with some of our civil engineers at the university to help we do some redesigns. And we're going to move into, I'm going to show you a couple examples of our, what we're going to move to in our solar panels. Um, so this is a current redesign. This um, figure was actually made by Javier Charon, who's one of our data analysts. And he's basically we're redesigning our communication towers to withstand storm force winds, to make them more resilient, make them stronger. And so this is one of our designs, kind of a tripod design, where the solar panel is much lower. But if in cases we need more power or need larger solar panels, we decide to kind of take a key off our GPSs, which actually survived the hurricane quite well, and which they used a, drill, the, a tripod of drilled down steel tubings welded to the actual um, GPS, the GPS mount. And we decided to take a, an idea and move it towards our solar panels to go with a similar design. Um, so this is our, our design that we have, that we essentially have four different tripods supporting a single solar panel. Now, the reason this is important to think about is we're not the only ones that are vulnerable. <laughs> we, are, we took the hit, but other observatories have dependencies on things like AT&T mobile data. AT&T mobile data was the first thing that went down on the island. I can, and put things in perspective, I can pull up my cell phone on island still, and it's a 50-50 chance whether or not I have signal. <laughs> um, so if we have dependency on single providers or a single infrastructure, that is something that all the networks should think about because um, we're trying to diversify our, our, our dependencies. Um, and we kind of know that there are some similar infrastructures out there. Um, the key takeaways are redundant communications are key. And so we try to come up with different ways to communicate with our data. And we do need to harden our stations. And it's something that we are currently redesigning. And the development of a, multi of a different backbones, especially things like satellite, using satellite, internet, and other data, um, radio or microwave, is a way to help harden our network. And other agencies should hopefully learn from what happened in Puerto Rico, so in case they get hit by a disaster or a catastrophic event, they can also harden the systems and aren't as severely as effective as we are currently. Um, I want to end by kind of thanking a lot of the people that have helped us out, especially the UPRM Mayaguez campus, NEIC, PTWC, um, the Caribbean Tsunami Warning Program, and local agencies of the Puerto Rico Emergency Management who have been great with supporting us, as well as our staff and especially our student staff, which have been working tirelessly since the hurricane. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for questions. The redesign is going to take a little bit more time. Um, right now, we're doing the quick and dirty get the stations back up. <laughs> um, I hope, a lot of it, right now, a lot of the stations are depending on the power authority getting the power back. Um, that's the unfortunate truth. So, whenever the, like I just mentioned, Calabra, it's completely fixed. We're just waiting for the Puerto Rico infrastructure. And so, we're unfortunately dependent right now on the power authority to get things back up running and with them. One day they say, oh, everyone will have power by December 15th, the next day, maybe January, February, June. <laughs> so it's a good question <laughs> for us. Yeah. All right. Um, well, right now, according to our technical staff, we've 
they were assuming that everything in the Virgin Islands is still destroyed because we haven't been able to physically open the vaults. Um, we have eight seismic stations and, acceler and accelerometers that need to be replaced out of 35. Um, then that's assuming that the Virgin Islands are gone. But on island, we lost two to flooding. So our vaults actually held quite well. <laughs> so our main issue is the telecommunications and having our station be able to talk to us. Okay. Can you speak up? Please speak. Actually, I can comment on that. We actually did have an amateur ham radio operator actually at the network after Maria working with us. So we did have that going, and we actually have plans to have courses in that to have make sure all of our staff are qualified. Okay, very last quick. It, it depends on the station, but most of our cars are, have months of data that we can get. Um, our, our technical staff have been to everywhere in, on Puerto Rico, as, including Culebra, and they've redone re data retrievals already for, for those stations. And if need be, they'll go back out and get, do another data, data retrieval. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next talk is looking at integrating data streams from in situ measurement, social networks, and satellite to be given by Patrick Matkin. Um, thank you. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and to present on behalf of my colleagues and co-authors from the Luxembourg's Institute of Science and Technology and the company Remote Sensing Solutions. Uh, examples of uh, integrating heterogeneous data streams from different uh, sources and to use this information to reduce the predictive uh, uncertainty of uh, operational flood forecasting and monitoring. Uh, we use the uh, hurricane season in the Americas as a large-scale test case to evaluate the usefulness of this type of uh, data. And our effort was in fact part of a much larger community effort um, that was initiated and coordinated by the uh, Global Flood Partnership. So the Global Flood Partnership is a cooperation um, framework between research organizations and uh, disaster managers um, to develop um, um, infrastructure for better uh, monitoring and predicting uh, flood disasters worldwide. And um, this slide that was um, put together by uh, Segi Cohen from the University of Alabama um, gives you a timeline of the um, GFP activities during the, uh, the event of Hurricane uh, Harvey. Um, in fact, the first um, email was sent to the um, GFP mailing list on the 28th of August. Um, that was like three days after landfall when, um, of course, groups in America had already started working on the event. And um, um, in that email, it was suggested that we use this uh, event of Harvey as a large-scale test case um, to evaluate and test the um, monitoring and uh, forecasting um, systems of the different members of the GFP. And that's how also we got uh, involved in this uh, effort. So from the moment that this email was uh, sent, um, different members of GFP started contributing um, their maps. Um, so these maps informed on precipitation, the extent of flooding, uh, water depth, soil moisture, uh, etc. And finally, the, uh, the maps, they were um, distributed to the uh, hurricane response community through a uh, dedicated um, uh, web portal um, where all the uh, members of GFP were uh, uploading their data to. Um, so I want to show you on the next slides how our group at, in, in Luxembourg contributed to this uh, community effort. And um, so from the 28th of August onward, um, we tried to build a database um, of freely available uh, data sets 
first using, of course, traditional uh, in situ measurements of uh, discharge, water level, precipitation, etc. Um, then uh, starting also um, collecting uh, tweets that are uh, related to the event. Um, so we use the same uh, API for streaming uh, the, um, uh, the data from uh, Twitter that was presented in the presentation beforehand. Um, and in addition to that, we used um, the regular stream of Earth observation data that comes from um, the space, uh, European Space Agency. So the, um, in the our case, we used mostly the data from uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Uh, and finally, all these data were used to um, um, retrieve critical information that can be used to uh, run um, and validate and then regularly update the uh, results of a large-scale uh, flood forecasting uh, model. So just a few words on the satellite data that we used in this effort. Um, so in uh, Europe, we have the Copernicus program, which is the largest uh, Earth observation uh, program we have in, in Europe. It is um, directed by the European Commission uh, in partnership with the European Space Agency. And one of the objectives of that mission is also to uh, provide um, accurate, um, timely and easily accessible data that can be used for flood disaster management. Um, and the two satellites that we used in, uh, in this effort are the one uh, that's called Sentinel-1. So the, the payload of, the, of that um, satellite is an, a synthetic Apache radar that uh, provides observation of the Earth's surface day and night and regardless of the weather conditions. Um, it's a two satellite uh, constellation that gives us um, every six days on, at the equator um, um, data from the exact uh, same orbit. When you combine ascending and descending uh, modes and, um, and you take account of the overlap, you can get an information over Europe every two days, which is of course a major advance compared to, to other satellites uh, um, or SAR satellites. Mm -hmm. And we also use the Sentinel-2 data, which uh, has a, as a payload a multispectral optical um, sensor. So in our group, we um, developed an algorithm for very quickly processing these data sets so that we retrieve the um, information on flooded areas um, in, a, in a very short time. And this method that we have developed is based on the statistical modeling. So we tried to parameterize a PDF that can be attributed to the water bodies, so the, the signature of backscatter coming from uh, water bodies. And the challenge is to differentiate um, the uh, response from the water bodies from the rest of the uh, of the area. And uh, when you have large scenes um, like uh, this one that was acquired on, on the 30th of uh, August on, in, in, in Texas, it's very difficult to separate the uh, signature from the water uh, bodies from the rest of the image. So what we have developed is an hierarchical split-based approach that um, uh, takes the entire image and splits it um, sequentially into sub-images and runs then a certain number of uh, statistical tests to s uh, find if a beam modality can be uh, identified so that it becomes possible to um, 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 parameterize a PDF that can be attributed to, to the presence of water on, on the Earth's surface. Um, so this is the result of it. You have first the entire scene, and as I showed beforehand, when you plot then the histogram of the backscatter values, um, there's no bis modality visible. Once you have applied this hierarchical splitting uh, approach, and you mask only uh, those areas, then the, you start um, being able to identify the um, response coming from the water bodies. And um, we have implemented this software on the uh, grid processing on demand environment of the European Space Agency. So this has two advantages. First, that we can have privileged access to, to satellite data. So we get the data uh, very quickly when they have been acquired. And we can use um, the uh, European Space Agency's processing um, capacities um, to run our processes in a very timely manner. So in the case of uh, Sentinel-1, this means that a user can quickly select um, the images that have been acquired uh, during the event um, and run the process to produce the uh, corresponding uh, uh, flood map. So in the case of uh, Hurricane Harvey, these are the maps that our, our group um, um, generated. Um, so it was possible to follow um, the, um, the flood event uh, over several days or several weeks in this case even. And we repeated the same exercise uh, later on when uh, Irma and Maria uh, hit the Americas as well. Um, so the second um, data stream that we were considering is the, 
information that can be retrieved from, uh, from Twitter or from social media in, in general. Um, so what we want to achieve is to have an, also a, flood pro a probabilistic flood map, um, ideally at a very high temporal and spatial resolution, telling us for different uh, grid cells the likelihood or informing us about the likelihood that certain grid cells are flooded or not at the, uh, over time. Now the problem is to, um, to geolocalize this uh, information. So you, as we have seen also in the presentation before, um, there is a lot of information in this uh, data stream and it's relatively easy to, um, to find the, the relevant tweets, but it's very difficult to geolocalize this information. And what you can do is you can uh, look in the metadata that is provided by, by Twitter. So sometimes these are the coordinates. Um, most of the time it's an indication of the place, like the name of a city, the name of, a, of the street. Um, but very often it's a very coarse um, in, uh, resolution information. Uh, what you can also do is to try to get this information directly from the uh, content that was uh, published on, on Twitter or from the photo that was uh, attached. Um, so we are still working on this because this turned out to be a very um, a complex task. Uh, we found a lot of information, of lot, a lot of photos that ha include information that would be useful for us to validate our flood maps and our flood forecasts. But for example, when you take this example, there's a, a user that published a picture of um, a backyard somewhere in a ward in Texas that was flooded. Um, but all we can um, tell from the metadata is that somewhere in Wharton a backyard was flooded. Um, so this is not yet a very useful information for uh, validating uh, our models or our um, remote sensing derived maps. So we are still working on this to um, maybe uh, um, use more advanced um, uh, analytics to re retrieve this information from the metadata or ideally to be able to recognize some infrastructure on the pictures that are, are posted so that we can more precisely uh, geolocalize this information. And um, as I said in the beginning, the ultimate aim is to integrate all this data into um, a flood forecasting uh, system. So we use the um, flood inundation model um, that was set up by the company RSS Hydro. So it's the Lislat FP2D model. Um, and still, I think I will not have the time to explain in detail how this uh, model was set up, but it provides on a regular basis um, large-scale maps of uh, water depths and velocity in the area affected by, by the flood. So now if we intercompare these different um, data sets, you can see here on the, uh, on the top uh, left the flood map that was obtained from Sentinel-1 imagery. Um, at the same time, or close in time, a Sentinel-2 uh, image was uh, acquired. And uh, on the left, you see as well the result of uh, the Lisflat FP model. So you see that um, there's a fairly good agreement between the optical Earth observation, the radar Earth observation, and, and the model. But when you look more, more closely, you find out that uh, each data set has its uh, limitation. So in the case of SAR, this is very often the, the problem that we have uh, don't see exactly the extent of flooding in urban areas and under vegetated um, to, um, canopies. With the model, we have often the problem that um, when you have um, um, unreliable topography data, it can cause huge overestimations or underestimations of, of the flood. And as I said before, with the Twitter data, it's very noisy and very difficult to uh, geolocalize. So we are still in the process of working on uh, developing a framework that helps integrating these um, um, different types of, of data sets. Here's another example of uh, the flood maps obtained uh, in the region of uh, Wharton that was also um, severely affected by the, uh, by the, uh, by the floods. Um, when we produced this map in the uh, framework of the GFP activity, um, there was some uh, concern that um, the SAR-derived flood maps do not inform on the, uh, uh, on the um, presence of water in urban areas. And of course, that's the, uh, the most risk-prone area there is. And uh, it's very important that our maps also give information on uh, flooded areas in uh, urban environments. Um, this example is to show you that there are ways to also uh, retrieve the information of uh, presence or not of water in urban areas using, using more advanced um, SAR data processing um, um, methodologies. Here we use as a reference um, an image from Worldview 2 that was um, provided by Digital Globe as part of their open data um, program. 
Um, you cannot see it very nicely here, but there are large areas of Houston, of course, that were uh, flooded. Um, when we use the um, SAR intensity image, uh, basically we see that um, um, we only uh, recognize the large areas of flooding in, on open land, but within the streets, it's very difficult to understand if there's water or not, because very often, uh, when you have water in the streets, you have not an, a, 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 a decrease of the backscatter, but on the contrary, you have an increase of the backscatter because of the um, double bounce effect that is caused by the uh, mirror effect of the water between the buildings. Um, so this is typically the areas that are indicated in blue, but it's a very weak signal and very difficult to make use of this to, um, to delineate the flooded areas. Um, but what we used then was to um, um, not only use the intensity uh, information from the star imagery, but also the coherence information. So we use the, um, the, the complex um, image, so that includes the information on the amplitude and the phase. And then suddenly you see that the presence of water leads to a, a very strong loss of coherence. So these are the, the areas indicated in, in red. So when you zoom in, um, this is a street or an area of Houston that has been uh, clearly flooded, as it was also shown by many pictures that have been posted from that area um, on Twitter. And uh, the areas in red um, would correspond to, a, uh, correspond to a loss of coherence, and this information can clearly be used to delineate also the um, extent of water in uh, dense uh, urban environments. Okay, I will uh, conclude. So. Um, I mean, the first conclusion of this work is that uh, it's quite trivial. So never before so much data was readily available to systematically, rapidly, and automatically uh, detect and record changes of water bodies. Um, there's globally and freely available data set available to um, run hydraulic models at very large scale. And also advanced image processing techniques are available to um, uh, retrieve information on the presence or not of water bodies. Also, as I showed, there's no doubt that there's a lot of information in all the data um, posted on, on social media, but of course, we still need to work on uh, advanced techniques to fully exploit these uh, uh, data, data streams. Um, and I gave some examples of how we can uh, achieve this to um, f fulfill this potential. So thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm afraid we don't have time for questions. I do want to apologize to the earlier speakers. As the session went on, we realized the timer keeps different time to the rest of the world. So you were getting rushed a little bit. <laughs> so I'm really sorry about that. That's why the last speakers might seem like they had a bit more time. We actually were going by reality. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So the a uh, talk that will conclude our session today is on increasing the, the increasing magnitude of rapid intensification in Atlantic hurricanes over the past 30 years, Ruby Leon. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, good morning. So, uh, thank you for um, having us give a talk in this session. So, um, as the title said, this is about uh, rapid intensification. And I would like to, first of all, um, kind of motivate why we are looking at this. So essentially, if we look at the 2017 hurricane season, uh, we have definitely four pretty strong hurricanes um, uh, making landfall in the uh, US or uh, nearby areas. And if we look at, um, let me see if I can use the mouse to point. Um, okay, so if we look at um, the, the hurricanes, so the different colors um, correspond to the category of hurricanes, meaning the, the wind speed of the hurricane. So for example, if you look at um, the yellow color, this is a category one hurricane, and then orange is cat two, and red is cat three. So if you see rapid changes from yellow to orange and to red, that means there is uh, rapid intensification going on. So let's just give an example of here, uh, if you look at Irma. So in the central uh, 
uh, or Eastern Atlantic uh, Ocean area. This is when Hurricane Emma actually um, intensified rapidly within 24 hours. And if you look at each of the cases that we talk about, you do see that uh, each hurricane in the 2017 season underwent rapid intensification, at least at some stages of their life, uh, lifetime over the ocean. And that's why the intensities uh, become pretty strong. So an important question for us is whether there have been any uh, changes in the frequency or, or, and or the amplitude of rapid intensification uh, in the past. So uh, to look at this, we uh, use the HERDAT data, essentially identify all the locations of hurricane tracks um, in the last uh, 30 some years. So we start from 1980, um, because this is the period when uh, we have satellite data, so the hurricane track locations are much more believable. So looking at that data, so essentially we, we separate the period into two, uh, two time period, one from 1986 to 2000, and then another one is from 2000 to 2015. So essentially a 30 year period with 15 years each. And so we plotted all the locations of uh, the hurricane track when rapid intensification occurred. So what it means by rapid intensification is essentially that the intensity of the hurricane increased by more than 30 knocks within a 24 hour period. So you can see uh, differences between the two time period. Um, so uh, here we color coded all, all these locations over here. So for example, if you see red color, it means that um, the intensification is more uh, is larger in terms of like how much it intensifies within a 24 hour period. Uh, but then if you look at the locations of all these different um, data points, we can also calculate the frequency of how often it happened uh, and also in which location, etc. So this is essentially the database that we use to look at rapid intensification over the last 35 years. So in this particular plot over here for 2001 to 2015, uh, I also um, indicated in this um, uh, magenta color, so these are the locations for 2017, uh, even though we did not use 2017 within the analysis period that we looked at. And then the red um, and the black dots are the ones corresponding to 2016. So now with this database, so first of all, we, we would like to see whether there has been any change in the frequency of rapid intensification in the past. So here I um, plotted out uh, in the two different regions. One is what we call the Western Atlantic Ocean, and then the other one is uh, Central Eastern Atlantic Ocean. And so we counted all the locations of the uh, hurricane tracks where there are hurricanes, as well as locations where there have been rapid intensification that occurred. And so we, when we look at frequency of rapid intensification, we look at two different aspects. One is simply to count how, many, how often it occurred in the past. Uh, but the second way is also to count uh, the conversion rate, meaning, for example, in a particular base, uh, ocean basin, you might have, let's say, 100 locations of hurricane passed by that area. How many of those locations actually undergone um, rapid intensification? So this is what we call conversion rate. So I, what I plotted over here are essentially the conversion rates uh, in the two ocean basin by year. So if we look at that, essentially um, doing a statistical test, we do not see any trend in terms of uh, frequency of rapid intensification over the past. Uh, whether you are looking at just rapid intensification frequency or the conversion rate of rapid intensification. Um, so then the next thing we look at is whether there, have, uh, there has been change in the in, uh, magnitude of rapid intensification, meaning within 24 hours, how uh, in, uh, was the intensity change in the hurricane um, that, that happened during that time period. So here we um, plotted out over here all the um, uh, intensity, rapid intensification magnitude for each year. And notice that some of these locations, there might be multiple data points uh, because um, uh, the Hurricane Center, the data set is identified by every five knocks. So, so if the intensification rate is like 5.5 or 5.9, it would be registered as the same data point. Um, so here we look at uh, the trend, the linear trend over the uh, last 30 years. 
And so we identified the median, which we plotted as the, um, over here, the, uh, this uh, magenta color. And then we also look at the 95th percentile of the uh, magnitude of rapid intensification, which are identified by the red dots for each year. And so we calculated the linear trend for both the median of rapid intensification magnitude, as well as for the 95th percentile of the rapid intensification magnitude. And so one thing we paid particular attention to is that when you look at all these locations of the uh, hurricane tracks that undergone uh, rapid intensification, there are spatial and temporal um, autocorrelation, right? Because if uh, because a, a hurricane location in a particular region and the next one, uh, six hours or 24 hours later, they may be experiencing about the same large scale environment and therefore they may be undergoing the same um, intensity change. So in order to uh, eliminate this um, autocorrelation uh, of time and space, we use a particular procedure of Monte Carlo method where we randomly sample the data points uh, so that we only pick the points that are at least 24 hours apart, so we don't account for points that are too close in time or space to be autocorrelated. So in that way, we, we can test the statistical significance of the changes uh, much more uh, precisely. And so what we found is essentially that if we look at the median, which is uh, the, the magenta colors over time, we did not see any statistically significant change in the median value of the magnitude of rapid intensification. But when we look at the 95th percentile, the red dots over there, then we obviously see a pretty big uh, increase in the uh, 95th percentile uh, RI values, uh, more than 95% um, confidence level. So this is particularly for the um, central eastern Atlantic Ocean area that we're looking at. So now after we identify that there have been changes in the magnitude of of rapid intensification, we wanted to understand what might be some of the factors controlling this. So essentially, we look at the last 30 years. We use a number of data sets, including particularly the global reanalysis data sets. We use two different reanalysis. One is the ERA interim, and also verify that using the NCEP, NCAR, uh, NCEP DOE reanalysis data, also using sea surface temperature, etc. So according to the paper by Kaplan, they identify several um, factors, large scale factors that are important for rapid intensification. So that include like sea surface temperature, uh, also the potential intensity, which include information about the sea surface temperature as well as temperature at the upper level. Uh, and then uh, upper level divergence winds, uh, the, o the ocean heat content, meaning that is the heat uh, not only at the surface, but integrating from the surface all the way down to 26 degrees Celsius uh, uh, iso uh, isotherm, so that when a hurricane passes by, if the warm layers are not deep enough, it might actually mix up the cold layers and cause cooling or cold wicks that would actually cause a um, uh, the hurricanes to weaken. So looking at all of this information together, then we, 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 we try to determine whether there have been any changes in the past. So in this uh, slide over here, we look at the trends in all the environmental factors that I just talked to you about. Uh, so mostly we identify that in the um, central and the eastern Atlantic Ocean, which is shown by the black box in each of the plot, uh, when we look at, for example, SST trend, uh, and also the trend in the potential intensity, the, um, the heat content over the ocean, and then the outgoing long wave radiation, the upper level wind divergence, as well as um, uh, as, as well as the wind shear. So we see mostly uh, statistically significant changes in the past uh, favoring the environment for rapid intensification. Uh, wind shear in particular is quite interesting because we don't look at two particular uh, reanalysis data set. They are consistent, but the magnitude is somewhat different. So if we look at uh, the NCEP uh, reanalysis uh, two, the uh, change in the wind shear is more significant than uh, in the Yao A interim. But in any case, all of these factors suggest that they are favoring the environment for rapid intensification over the central eastern Atlantic Ocean. So the next thing we look at is that um, 
Looking at all of these different environmental factors, we know that they are not all independent, right? Because the large scale environment are quite uh, consistent with one another. For example, the wind shear may be related to the sea surface temperature. The upper level divergence might also be related to the sea surface temperature. So what we did over here is for each of the environmental factor that we, that we listed over here, first of all, we looked at the correlation between rapid intensification time series over the last 30 years with the environmental factors uh, one at a time. So the uh, blue bars over here shows that there are quite a few um, environmental factors that are highly correlated with the rapid intensification at 95th percentile or 90 percentile confidence level. And then the pink bars are the ones when we first look at uh, the SST correlation and then use partial correlation to remove any correlation between the last square environmental factors with SST. So after we do that, we find that essentially most of the other, most of the factors, the, the pink bars or the ones that we, we don't show anything, meaning that there is equal to zero, meaning that actually mostly, most of these other factors are correlated with SST. So most important is really SST trend in the past pretty much explain all of the variability of the changes over the last 30 years. And so lastly, then we also look at like how, what might be controlling the SST over the central eastern Atlantic Ocean. And so we use three uh, factors, uh, the AMO, ENSO, and the North Atlantic Oxidation. And then we find that these three factors altogether explain 41% of the changes in the SST in the past. But interestingly, if we add global mean sea, sea surface temperature, throw it into the correlation, we find that it can explain altogether 70% of the variability of rapid intensification in the past. And after we throw in the global mean sea surface temperature, we find that all these other factors, AMO, ENSO, and NNO became uh, insignificant, meaning that the global mean sea surface temperature basically explain most of the changes in, that we have been seeing in the past for rapid intensification. Uh, in the Western Atlantic Ocean, I'm just saying that we did not see any change e either in the frequency or the intensity of rapid intensification at all. So lastly, summarizing, just main, three main points. What we found is that there has been changes in the magnitude of hurricane in rapid intensification in the past, uh, mainly in the Central and Eastern Atlant Atlantic Ocean. And we found that these changes are related to conspiring changes in the large scale environment, particularly related to sea surface temperature. And that even though uh, some of these decadal variability like AMO and, uh, and is explaining uh, part of the variability of the rapid intensification, we find that global mean sea surface temperature actually has a larger role to play. And therefore, we cannot exclude the possibility that global warming actually is, has been playing a role in the rapid intensification in that region. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for one very quick question and then we go to break. All right. Seems okay, like you. people are desperate. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, the union session right after the break follows on also looking at the recent hurricane season. So thank you all.